Hi, everybody, and welcome to the International Water Resources Association webinar on Rice to the River. We have an excellent panel here today, uh, really a big panel. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, specialists uh, lined up to speak about this really exciting topic that's um, driving a lot of conversation in the uh, water field, um, both in the practitioner side about people asking how that how rivers can be protected uh, so, uh, on a theoretical level asking you know what rights do do do, do rivers have uh, and also uh, in, in more the the legal and um, policy realms as well so we're going to bring a lot of these different uh, perspectives together here today and uh, here's some great presentations I'm going to give everyone just one or two more minutes if you want to go get yourself a last minute cup of coffee uh, or uh, water or whatever it is uh, your hour of day uh, so we're going to get started in just one or two minutes thank you so much Okay, well, it's a few minutes after. The church bells have stopped sounding, so I think it's time for us to get the webinar started. We have such a big panel, I don't want to be crunched for time. So I want to thank everyone here again today for the joining the International Water Resources Association webinar on Rights to the River. We have a great panelist here today, including Anne DeVrice Sojin, a PhD candidate at the Tilburg Law School, Herman Casper Gilson, assistant professor at Urich University, I think a Lamboy, a professor at the uh, Neroid uh, Business University, Katie O'Brien, a lecturer at Monash University, Kathy Sukins, uh, affiliated researcher at uh, Ulrich University, Marlene Van Riesdrich, uh, professor at Ulrich, and uh, Suzanne Wuch, um, a senior researcher at the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment in the Netherlands. So, as you can see, it's a big panel. We have a lot of people here today. We're excited to have them all. Um, as you probably know, this is a webinar hosted by the International Water Resources Association. The IWRA is an international network of researchers and practitioners who work on a multidisciplinary range of water resource issues. It's a nonprofit, non governmental, and educational organization, and we are supported by your membership. So if you'd like to go to our website at www.iwra.org, uh, you can find our membership section and become a member, or at least uh, learn more and then uh, make up your mind. Uh, we hope that you join us. As you probably know, if you've joined some of our webinars in the past, um, this is a uh, many of our webinars are based on special issues of our flagship journal water international which has been around we were just discussing around the office the other day the many years has been around i think we're uh, nearing uh nearing our, our anniversary of uh we're over 40 years old for our flagship journal so um we have a lot of we published a lot of great articles and um we would appreciate if you you go look it up yeah, cite us and, um, and if you're interested in uh, submitting a special issue of your own, uh, you can be in touch with us and we'll be happy to facilitate that. Uh, but this uh, webinar today comes from a special issue of that uh, journal. And uh, you can look up all those articles online, uh, search uh, Google uh, Water International. And uh, we'd be uh, happy for you to read the articles and, of course, cite them. Um, as you probably know, the IWRA provides a global uh, knowledge-based forum for bridging disciplines and geographies by connecting professionals, students, individuals, and corporations, and institutions, everyone who's concerned with the sustainable use of the world's water resources. Uh, just because we come from an academic background with journals and articles and such like that doesn't mean that we're limited to only academia. We have a lot of members who come from uh, the practitioner base, uh, we have a lot of students, um, and we have a lot of uh, people who are just uh, interested in the water, world's water resources, people from the business community is including. I'm really happy to have you here, everyone in the audience here today. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, so uh, today our panel will talk about a common theme of what rivers need and whether or how rights-based regimes can help uh, fill these needs beyond the possibilities of existing traditional river basin management setups. So our panel will touch upon these different angles of the river rights debate and uh, bring that together with a cross-section of property rights and the pressing questions about custodianship and how that will play out.
So we're really looking forward to hearing our panelists explain these themes, but particularly through uh, different case studies. I think what's really interesting here today is how many different uh, regions um, we have case studies coming from. Uh, it really gives you an idea. I mean, this uh, Rights of the River, uh, at first a few years ago when it came on the scene, it seemed a little um, perhaps unusual, uh, innovative. But now we're seeing it uh, being tried out in river basins uh, around the world. Um, and so we're able to kind of look at how it's being implemented in different contexts, uh, maybe see what best practices are coming together and to understand how it's played out in different jurisdictions. So I know that if a lot of you um, enjoy the interactive nature of our webinars, and if you'd like to continue the discussions we have here today, we really encourage you to reach out on our LinkedIn webpage. We're gonna have a summary of the event and as always, uh, links to the recordings and to the uh, presentations uh, that our uh, great panelists have here today. So go ahead and follow us on LinkedIn and uh, go ahead and continue the conversation. We'll have a nice little debate and a discussion there as well. So go ahead and weigh in on the issues and uh, bring up any questions you might have. If this is your first time joining us here for one of our webinars, let me just briefly review the format uh, to help you out. Um, uh, each of our panelists will give a short presentation and then we will have a small poll and then we will have a time for questions from the audience. So uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask our panelists, um, either single panel, so the whole group, just go ahead and send it in. You'll see there on the right-hand uh, control panel for your GoToWebinar, it'll say questions. If you go ahead and type your question in there, it'll come right to me. I'll be able to see it and direct your question to the appropriate panelists at the time for questions. Um, that'll be good. If you have any question that's very particular about um, one of our panelists' uh, slides or anything, go ahead and reach out. Look them up on the internet and uh, uh, send an email, and they're very friendly folk, and I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, engage you. Uh, every academic loves to hear questions about their work uh, and feel uh, feel like someone's really enjoying it and reading it and engaging. So I'm sure they'll be happy to answer your questions. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Kathy Sukins. Okay, thanks so much, Scott, for the lovely introduction. Um, oh, yes, I will uh, share my screen probably. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. share my screen. There you go. <clears throat> okay. That looks so good. Oh, can you? Sorry, I think the PowerPoint is lost now. Can you see the PowerPoint? I can. Uh, it looks great. Ah, okay, here, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, hi, my name is Kathy, and um, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, our special issue before giving the floor, of course, to the wonderful authors that contributed to the special issue. So just a bit of background why we wanted to start writing this special issue. We um, started writing it actually in uh, August 2017 and it was kind of triggered of course by all these different uh, initiatives by lawmakers and judges in different areas of the world. Um, and at the same time the realization, at least from an EU perspective, that it was a bit underexplored in, writ in uh, literature. Um, so we thought it might be good to have a really um, holistic special issue tackling the rights-based regimes from different angles, bringing everything together, having a helicopter perspective on the issue, and then making some meaningful um, conclusions and, and, and that are actually uh, readily implementable in, in practice. So <clears throat> if we go back on to these developments and initiatives that I just mentioned of these lawmakers and judges around the world. Of course, the most famous example, famous example is the one um, where New Zealand in March 2017 granted legal rights to the Wanganui River. Um, then in India, the one of the high courts, the Uttarakhand High Court, declared the Ganga, the Yamuna and their tributaries as living entities. And then two months later, the Constitutional Court of Colombia declared the, uh, gave legal rights to the Atrato River. And what these different initiatives have in common is the consideration that conservation efforts for water resources need to be expanded for the river itself and often combined with the rights of indigenous people. 
and I rather like this quote by Professor David Boyd, who says that we must no longer view the natural world as a mere warehouse of commodities for humans to exploit, but rather a remarkable community to which we belong and to whom we owe responsibilities. So this is something that rather rings true for us as editors of, of the special issue with uh, Marlene and Herman Kasper. Um, and so for the past months, especially, uh, it, this, the topic of rights-based regime has really gained traction and press coverage all around the world. So these are just some of the headlines. Um, only last week, The Guardian covered an, an, an in-depth report of, uh, of river-based uh, rights-based regimes. And then you see all these other uh, initiatives that took place over the past years, uh, as Bangladesh, for example, also gave uh, rivers rights um, and all the consequences that are attached to that. To that. Um, importantly to mention is that our special issue does not glorify the concept of rights-based regimes for rivers as a miraculous solution to all water-related problems. The papers in the special issue look at if and how river rights regimes may remove some of the existing barriers in water management and in some cases, the answer is positive. For example, with regard to the Wanganui River, where the added value is real and tangible. In others, the answer is rather negative. Um, for example, one of our papers focuses on the Ganga and Yamuna rivers and their tributaries in uh, India. And it almost, re almost reads as a pamphlet against uh, declaring universal rights for rivers. And one of the major attention points that relates to the Ganga and the Yamuna River, and it's also the reason why it's current, why the, the, the judgment of the High Court was actually stayed by the Supreme Court, is the transboundary nature of rivers. So, for example, if you look at this map of uh, rivers in uh, in the EU, almost all rivers in the EU are transboundary of nature. So one state cannot simply grant rights to rivers and appoint an, a custodian without all the river, all the states sharing the river being on board and having a clear enforceable um, legal framework in their respective territories to enforce these river rights. Um, so this was a problem for the Uttarakhand High Court judgment where the, the rivers run through Bangladesh and these extraterritorial competences um, are not clear cut for India. So um, that's it on my side, only a couple of minutes and I'll give the floor back to Scott probably who will introduce the next uh, panelist. Certainly will. I really appreciate that uh, presentation and the overview that you were able to provide for us. One of the things I've enjoyed about the rights of the river as it's kind of unfolded is that we're able to learn about it almost in real time. I think sometimes um, from the water policy perspective, you know, when we're looking at a historical um, events, it, we're doing re almost archival research. Um, you know, you're looking at something like um, to understand the unfolding of um, international cooperation around river basins. Uh, that's happened uh, quite some time ago. But here with the rights of the river, uh, not to detract from the great work that activists have been doing for a long time around this, but uh, we're seeing court cases coming out now, right as, as, as we're watching. So it's a lot more exciting. And I appreciate you kind of bringing in that historical approach uh, to bring us up to contemporary uh, times. Uh, our next presenter will be Susan uh, Widgets. Uh, who will be presenting from Herman Casper's uh, spot there. So, uh, Susan, uh, thank you for uh, joining us there. Very okay. correct office. Um, one moment, please. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen like this? Absolutely. It looks great. Yes. Okay. Thank Lots you. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for this introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to present here the results of the paper that I wrote with my co-authors co that are uh, mentioned here on this uh, introduction slide. What we did in this uh, study is that we um, analyzed what uh, would be 
the effects of transferring river rights uh, when you look at it from an ecological perspective? Would it help to increase effectiveness? And uh, for this reason, we formulated three questions uh, and we started to peel off this question with uh, what does a river need to be healthy from an ecological perspective? So trying to dig in what is necessary to achieve this good ecological status and how do these condition, uh, needs relate to the conditions for effective water quality governance. Uh, and then finally take the step at reflecting how the transfer of rights would serve those needs uh, for a healthy liver, river. And I uh, emphasize that it's the ecological perspective that we picked here and not the human rights perspective. Um, we approach this from the European context and there we have two major streams of relevant ambitions. And the first one is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and especially Goal 6, uh, which says that by 2020, all water related ecosystems should be protected and restored. And the other major stream is the Water Framework Directive, which sets at a European level specific objectives for the good ecological and chemical status of all its waters, since they consider it as a heritage for future generations. However, so far, member states are struggling quite a bit to realize these objectives. Uh, this is a projection uh, produced by the European Environmental Agencies. And the greener the picture gets, the less likely it is that the water framework objectives will be met in 2027. As you, and as you can see, there's quite a lot of green going on. So uh, there's very much interest in uh, developing ideas on how these, uh, this, these issues could be overcome. <clears throat> so we try to reflect a bit on what could be explanations for these difficulties. And first of all, uh, it's good to mention that water issues are in general complex issues. They entail multi-levels in terms of institutional levels, multi-scales in terms of hydrologies, but also multi-disciplines are necessary to um, achieve objectives. And what we found in previous research is that different scholars and actors hold different perspectives on effectiveness and that could be regarded as quite self-evident but it could also um, explain for a lot of confusion going on for instance an ecologist has quite a different idea about what effectiveness means when you compare it to a social scientist um, so uh, what we found is that all these different perspectives add to the concept of effectiveness but that you need to assess them in coherence with each other. And the legal strand here is that the idea is that the transfer of rights would uh, contribute to an increased effectiveness. So these are the steps that we undertook for our study. We first identified the river's needs from literature and then specified those needs into specific objectives, which were much more tailored than the general objectives I mentioned earlier. We identified what could be governance conditions needed for those objectives and then finally reflect upon the impacts of the transfer of rights to the realization of these objectives. Well, first of all, the river needs, they can more or less categorized into three main groups. First group is the hydrology. So that's more related to the water itself, the water system, the, the discharge, but also the interaction with groundwater. Morphology, which is more related to the soil and the uh, waterfronts, the shading and so on. And finally, the physical chemical requirements. Those are the requirements related to nutrients, for instance, in terms of eutrophication, but also toxicity is an important element. And we tailored that even a bit further down into what we call in the Netherlands the ecological key factors. And there we try to specify them uh, really closely uh, and it's in line with the requirements of the Water Framework Directive uh, into nine different uh, specific elements. Uh, here in the picture, um, I'm not sure whether you can see the mouse here, but uh, you see 10, but the context one is our viewpoint of this analysis. So we don't take that one into account, but furthermore, you can see nine different uh, key factors 
that contribute to an ecological uh, status. And they are quite different by nature. So that is important to, to be aware of. Um, and for those nine conditions, we compared the governance conditions. And to this end, we used the framework developed by Van Rijswijk, uh, which uh, takes a three-dimensional three -dimensional approach to identify governance conditions. And it's related to content organization and implementation. And we combined for each of those key factors, we analyzed what would be the relevant governance conditions. So here I come to some results and it's only a very quick overview due to, for the sake of time. And what you can see here is for the uh, key factor connectivity, we identified what are the different governance conditions and also for the key factor load, which is related to nutrients. Um, we identify what is their contribution to the ecosystem, but also what are the circumstances that are necessary to achieve a good status. And what you can see here, if you look at, for instance, the actors involved, is that uh, they are quite uh, different between those different key factors. So it is uh, for different specific needs, you might need a little bit different conditions. And that is something we think is important. In this slide, you see more or less the same results, but more visualized. For each of the key factors, we have identified which different actors have to be involved. And as you can see, this is quite different for the different uh, key factors. And what we found for the Netherlands is that um, the water authorities have a tendency to mainly focus so far on the key factors that they can address themselves. And much less on the factors where they have to engage with many other parties because it's getting so much more complex. So that was one of the important outcomes of, of the study. Uh, so I'll come to some conclusions and reflections. Um, as I said before, uh, different needs have different uh, needs towards the conditions of governance. And that's usually general objectives as been formulated by United Nations in the Sustainable Development Goals, but also in the European Water Framework Directive, they are too generic. So they need to be specified on what is specifically needed. Um, <clears throat> and when you look at the transfer of right, rights, of course, it is potentially a better raised voice for the river, but it doesn't um, a priori set uh, different priority settings. So that what I would like to wanted to say is that there is always this balance with other interests which needs to be taken into account. If you look at the European setting, and especially the Netherlands, multiple usage is taking place in a river basin. And there's always this balancing with other interests which needs to take place. And um, it's always difficult to get uh, this focus on ecological objectives. And finally, there's <laughs> the issue of scale and custodianship, which should be taken into account, since water issues are often covering different scales, a custodian should be able to act effectively at those different uh, scales. So that is also an important thing to consider. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I would like to hand over um, uh, now to Scott. Thank you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that presentation. And I think what was really great about it was the way that you were able to look at these different factors um, that go into the rights of the river. I mean, sometimes I think it's very easy, especially when we're coming from a certain disciplinary background to say, well, the rights of the river, the river needs this, but really it's a lot of factors that come together and the rights that the river has may relate to one factor or another factor at different times. So it's really important to have that whole kind of holistic uh, approach rather than just a siloed uh, disciplinary approach. That was great. Our next presentation will come from Anne de Vries Stojan. Uh, Thank you. I think she's... Um, there you yeah. go. Okay, I will share my screen. Thank you. Ah, oh, that looks great. Let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you, Scott. Um, I'm really happy that uh, I'm, uh, I can uh, present the paper that I wrote together with Elon van Ham and Kees Bastmeijer for the special issue. Um, 
and I will be um, talking today a little bit about assigning ownership directly to nature. So that's just a small aspect of rights to the river. Um, and I'm focusing on property rights. And the question that uh, we asked is, is that the next step in, in protecting the environment? So is that the future? Um, now, first, let's go back a little bit to the past, uh, to John Locke. Um, this is an ancient, uh, ancient way of looking uh, you could say at the earth, but it's still quite present nowadays in um, uh, in many of our um, political decision making. Uh, the earth and all that is therein uh, is given to men uh, for the support and comfort of their um, being. So that means that uh, the earth is basically there to exploit uh, for for ourselves as humans. Um, now we. Uh, came quite a long way, I think, from, from that. Um, so you see that in 1982, the UN uh, had a very different approach to nature, um, stating that every form of life is unique, warranting respect, regardless of its worth to men. So that's quite different. And also we see that in the EU and many other legal systems, you now have extensive environmental laws that aim to protect the environment. Um, and what we also see, and that's quite interesting, is that, for example, the World Wildlife Fund, um, uh, acquires ownership to not use it, to protect nature against exploitation. So um, that looks quite good now, but if we look at, at the state of the world at the moment, we see that we use up 1.75 planets per year. Um, we have faced global warming, we're utterly failing in addressing that so far. Uh, we see that um, insects are dying worldwide and we have a plastic soup. So um, this triggered a question with us, do we maybe need a little bit more than environmental protection uh, via public law? And I'm a private lawyer and uh, Elon is also a private lawyer. Uh, so we decided to look at private uh, protection via property rights. Um, so yeah, it doesn't look good, but maybe we can um, have additional tools. Um, and first, before looking at this really innovative idea of granting ownership to nature itself, we looked at what we already have. And we looked at our own uh, country, the Netherlands. Um, and there, uh, if you want to read more, by the way, you can see uh, our publication here. So um, yeah, if you have questions, there might be some answers there. Um, but we looked first at the Netherlands and there we have um, uh, Nature Monuments. Nature Monuments is a society with over 790,000 members who all, all pay a yearly fee. Uh, and from that money, Nature Monuments buys and maintains land for the purpose of uh, nature conservation. And it's quite successful. It owns now 101,000 hectares, um, which might not be a lot for somebody in the US or Canada, but the Netherlands is a small country. So this is relatively successful. Nature Monuments is now the second largest landowner after the state. Um, we also looked at New Zealand because this is where this innovative um, idea uh, was first seen to grant ownership to nature. Um, but they already had some ways of using property rights to protect nature there already. Uh, and the best uh, known example, I would say, is the Queen Elizabeth II Trust. Um, this trust allows private owners to uh, join that scheme uh, by concluding a conservation governance, which is an agreement with the trust and in that agreement uh, the owner promises not to use his land or uh, in a way that uh, affects nature or maybe to uh, do something like pest control and those duties are passed on to subsequent owners so it should lead to sustainable protection um, and there's also to make sure that everyone complies with these uh, conservation governance the trust supervises and even is willing to go to court if they feel that a conservation governance is um, not complied with. Um, now it's also uh, quite successful if you look at um, the amount of hectares uh, it's more than 180,000 at the moment uh, on the other hand, New Zealand is much bigger than the Netherlands. So in comparison, you could say it's not that successful. Uh, but what you see in this chart here, I got it from the, the website uh, of uh, the, the trust, is that in recent years, it became extremely popular. So there's a good chance that this uh, protected areas will increase also in the future. Now, what we wanted to know is what are the pros and cons of a private nature protection? protection via uh, property rights. 
So a pro that we identified is that it's independent from states. So if the if politics is failing to do something, then um, private owners can step up. But on the other hand, that's voluntary, so you can't force anyone. Then a pro is that it can lead to long-term protection as well, because uh, you can make uh, you can use property rights to um, in a way that duties pass on to next owners. But to really make it sustainable, you need to monitor and supervise uh, the property rights, and that can be expensive. Um, you also see, or we also see that in New Zealand, at least, it's becoming increasingly popular. Um, similar stories we heard about the US with uh, so-called conservation easements. We haven't researched that. Um, but you could say that even though um, owners are very enthusiastic, um, they may lack specialized knowledge to uh, uh, do nature conservation like pest control. So that's a con. Then a pro is that it is additional to public environmental law and looking at the state of the world now, we need all the tools we can get. Uh, but you could also say this is less suitable private property rights as a way to protect uh, the nature for areas that are owned by many smaller different private owners because you need everyone on board um, to protect nature, especially with a river. If one person is polluting, that affects the whole river. Um, then a pro is that it limits public expenses. So if private parties join in, it, it may cut on uh, public expenses. Um, but we shouldn't overestimate uh, what you can do with property rights. There's also legal limitations. For example, in the Netherlands, in Netherlands it's very difficult to impose positive duties on owners, such as planting trees. That's very difficult via property rights. Um, and also you can't own everything you can't own water you can't own air we can't own the high or we we do not own the high seas and the polar regions and another question that we could ask ourselves is could this may make, make states lazy because they say well uh, private parties will just solve the problem now because of these uh, also disadvantages um, to current uh, property rights we wanted to look at the very innovative way of using property you could say um, in respect to the Whanganui River in New Zealand. So the Whanganui, Whanganui River as, uh, as Katie already mentioned uh, got legal personhoods and it now also owns its own river bedding. And what I would like to mention is that this comes uh, stems largely from Maori culture the indigenous people from New Zealand uh, who see themselves as part of nature rather than having a dominion over nature. Um, so even though it is a very interesting um, development, we should also realize that it might not fit with the way uh, some other Western societies look at, at the relationship between humans and nature. Um, now, how has this been done? Um, the Wanganui Ritha, uh, it's, it's done via an act, the Te Awa Tupua Act, um, and uh, that act states that the river is seen as one living whole. Um, then the river is giving legal personhood with all the rights, powers, duties and liabilities of a legal person. So that's very interesting. Um, but you want the river also to be able to speak and to conclude contracts, for example, and then you need humans. So there's a representative body, just like we have with companies, that represents the river. And it consists of a Maori representative and a Crown representative. Um, so what are the effects of, of, um, of this new system? An important effect, and I will focus on, on, on property rights, is that all uh, Crown-owned parts of the riverbed are now transferred to the river. And those parts can no longer be alienated. So you can't mortgage them, you can sell them. In the Netherlands, we would say this is no longer property because for us, property is always something that you can transfer, you can alienate. Um, what this also means is that the river becomes liable as an owner. Um, and that is, is, leads, can lead to quite some, quite some odd results. So for example, here, if uh, after the transfer of ownership, a new structure is built like a dam and that dam breaks and there's damage then the river might have to pay, or actually probably has to pay as an owner. Um, now, there's also some limitations. So already existing structures, for example, liability for that remains with the state. Um, and if the river cannot pay, by the way, then uh, the river can um, apply with the, uh, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Land Information for funding. So um, that's interesting. Also, the river has to pay tax. Um, to certain parts of it, its income. 
So what we see is we started off with wanting to protect nature, but we end up with the river being liable as an owner and paying tax. So we could wonder, is that always practical? Uh, and can maybe the river go bankrupt? Um, and that would be very unwanted. So these are all practical questions that private lawyers ask themselves if we hear about this. Now, there's also some limitations. Um, a limitation is that the Act does not um, transfer private property uh, to the uh, RIFA. So that means that uh, private owners are still owner of their part of, of the RIFA. Um, and if they want to transfer, that can happen, but it needs full consent of the private owner. So you see that even though it's one living whole, uh, still different parts of the RIFA can be owned by different uh, people. Um, and a limitation also is that water cannot be owned, uh, which means that the river owns its bedding, but it doesn't own the water. And that's a limitation uh, in property right or in property law itself. So um, what are the pros and cons of this innovative approach, uh, transfer own transferring ownership to a part of nature? Um, a pro is uh, that is a very strong, uh, maybe even political signal that nature gets its own voice. And that may lead to a shift in thinking um, about human nature relationship. It may trigger some more responsible behavior in humans. Um, now, important legally is that the river can go to court now. And that could be a huge advantage, for example, also in the EU, where you see that on the EU level, it can be quite difficult to go to the European Court of Justice. Um, so there's legal standing. Another pro is that the river is more independent from the whims of politics because it's not, not owned any longer largely by the state. And legally also very important is that river-owned parts can no longer be transferred or alienated. Um, so it's very sustainable. A con, however, is that um, this is still human-made, so you can take away ownership, you can take away legal personhood, if you like. Um, you could say uh, a limitation is that private ownership is unaffected. A limitation is, as I said, that water cannot be owned. And you could also wonder whether this is practical to make a river liable or to let it pay tax. And also, it's probably in the end equally expensive for the state because if the river can't pay for its liability, then it's probably still the state that's going to pay. So what is, does, uh, this is my final slide. So what is, does this bring us for the future? Personally, I think that um, uh, this approach is in particular very interesting for parts of the earth that are not owned by anyone at the moment. So for example, the polar regions, um, there's states that want to drill there and nobody can really do something about it because nobody owns those places. The same with the high seas and pollution that, pollution that we see there. You could even say that in space, which humankind is also polluting, nobody owns it, so it's difficult to step up. So this might be a very interesting way of uh, giving uh, the world a voice where it has no voice yet. Another interesting question is maybe we could use this also for protecting animals better. So these animals are in the Netherlands, they're treated really badly uh, for meat consumption. Um, and some people say that they should get more rights like humans so that they can have their own voice in courts as well. So I think there's a lot of uh, food for thought. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. I would like to give back the flo digital floor to, to Scott. Well, thank you for that presentation. I really appreciated the kind of long range and being able to bring in the long range views that you brought in and also the uh, philosophical uh, underpinnings uh, that you were able to kind of draw to. I think it's really helpful to explore these from a really personally as a lawyer myself uh, from a law background uh, to be able to say, OK, well, this is what the law says and, and here's the framework that would actually happen. Uh, I think that can be very helpful to kind of uh, explore how this can be really implemented in the future. So thank you for the presentation. Our next presentation will come from Herman Casper Gilson. Herman Casper is uh, his first name, not his whole name. So if you're looking him up and you want to cite him, it's Gilson. I'm sure he'd like that. Herman can't hear you. You have it uh, muted, I think. Yes. Excellent. And if you could again uh, make it, yeah, just like that. There you go. Yeah. Boom. Okay. Thank Thanks. you for the introduction. Uh, this is a pretty exciting event. Uh, I, I hope you're still still with us. Um, 
Yeah, for, for today, uh, uh, I want to briefly address some aspects of uh, uh, ecocentric rights-based approaches uh, within the EU, uh, within EU transboundary river basin uh, governance. We have uh, published this paper in the special issue. We've, uh, I've presented it at the European Environmental Law Forum in uh, 2019 here in Utrecht. Uh, and this issue will also be addressed, uh, I heard this uh, only recently, this, this morning uh, at the 17th World Water Congress in Daegu in spring 2020. Uh, so it's an uh, important topic. Uh, I will uh, address some key aspects of it. Uh, as we have a limited amount of time, I will uh, discuss the relevance. I will discuss some uh, uh, key questions. I will slightly touch upon the concept of river rights, but I will focus more on custodianship as river rights has been addressed by uh, Suzanne already um, with the other speakers. Um, and I will give some uh, conclusions. Uh, yeah, for, for now, I think uh, the conclusions will, will uh, be positive and negative uh, both. Uh, I think uh, uh, having a, a, a rights-based approach uh, could be of added value in EU water uh, law, water governance. Uh, it is possible, uh, but I fear it's not feasible and effective uh, at this moment. So that's uh, it for the, for, for the conclusions. Um, <clears throat> yeah, about the relevance. Um, uh, Cathy has already mentioned that the EU has uh, many transboundary river basins. Uh, and if you also uh, keep in mind that uh, the status of the water quality and the ecological pot uh, potential uh, is uh, at best questionable in most of these uh, integrated river basin districts across the EU. Uh, and you also keep in mind that uh, uh, effective integrated river basin management requires uh, dedicated and effective coordination and cooperation mechanisms. Uh, and it's so well documented issue that, that that's currently lacking. Um, then you see that, 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 that there are, are certain problems regarding water quality and ecological potential. Um, yeah, well, there, there, there are some existing approaches to, to, to better water quality, uh, but these uh, seem to have reached their limits more or less. Uh, and uh, that, that, that might give uh, uh, a necessity for the consideration of more unconventional approaches. Uh, which can be found in uh, rights-based approaches. Uh, we've seen the development thereof uh, worldwide, and that can be a rich source of uh, inspiration also for EU water governance. Uh, this brings me to, to some relevant questions. Would right, uh, a, a ecocentric, a, a ecological rights-based approach uh, or the introduction of custodianship, uh, would that be of added value in the EU system of integrated river basin management. Um, assuming that that is the case, so that, 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 that it could be of added value, uh, then uh, two next qu questions emerge. Uh, how could river rights be formulated? Where can these best be implemented? That's a substantive dimension about river rights. Uh, for today, the focus will be mostly on uh, uh, the institutional dimension. So who would be the custodian and what's the role of a custodian uh, in protecting the river? Uh, and uh, preventing it, uh, uh, safeguarding it from infringements on its, its rights. Um, yes, as uh, Suzanne has already addressed the, the, the needs of a river or the, what, what does a river actually want, uh, what we clearly see is that there's a, a tension, a friction between the human perspective and the ecocentric perspective. That's a, a tension between ecological needs and uh, human needs, mostly human needs, for instance, as you see on the picture, navigability of uh, rivers, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a clear human need, but does a, really need, uh, that, does a river really need to be uh, nav navigable uh, in order to be, calling, uh, to, to be able to call the river a river from that perspective? Um, now, if you focus on uh, the rights of the river, uh, we can refer to the Earth Law Center. In 2017, it has uh, drafted some, some river rights, uh, which includes the right to flow, uh, the right to perform essential functions in its ecosystem, uh, to be free from pollution, uh, to be fed and be fed by sustainable aquifers, native biodiversity, and a right to restoration. Um, well, if, if you place that in the, uh, the, the, the framework of specific rivers, you can, you can address specific river needs. 
uh, we've done it in, in, in our paper, so you can, you can read it for the River uh, Scheldt and the River Ames, which have uh, uh, particular needs. Um, Yes, then uh, uh, moving to the substantive dimension of, of custodianship. Um, what, 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 what is this, what, what, what's the role of a custodian? That, that, that's an important question, I guess. Uh, we are uh, on the talking already about uh, a re representation of uh, a river, a voiceless river in port. Uh, but we think in the European, uh, in the EU uh, dimension, we can, we can take it a step further and give the custodian a more uh, uh, important role also in uh, relevant stages of policy making and decision making. So not only in court, but if need be also in court. Um, and uh, what should a custodian do? It's, it's mostly argue from a river system specific rights and needs to so take an uh, eco, uh, ecocentric perspective, uh, but to be realistic, you should uh, not be blind for other socioeconomic needs as well. Um, then the more institutional dimension of custodianship. Um, yeah, most river basin districts in the EU, we, we, we've heard it already, are uh, transboundary in na nature. So uh, we think that uh, a custodian should also operate at the river basin level, so, so the international uh, river basin level. Uh, for most rivers in the EU, uh, river conventions have been uh, drafted and uh, river commissions have been established. So I think that that uh, custodian should also uh, operate at that particular level of uh, 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 river basins, so at the transboundary level. Um, now, as we also see that um, river basin governance arrangements, they, 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 they're, they're very different across the EU. Uh, so that leads to, the, to, to a conclusion that there is actually no one-size-fits-all model for, uh, for, for, for custodianship, but it should uh, 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 better be, be, be tailored to regional circumstances. Uh, so so it, it, it actually needs to fit governance settings, uh, which are cultural, which can be administrative, which can be legal. Uh, so be it, it should be suited. Um, and then essential is that a custodian should also be recognized by all other relevant authorities uh, operating within the river basin. Uh, it should have a, a proper mandate, it should have proper power and resources, uh, but also important is that it can operate independently from, from other political uh, organs. So it should be actually uh, politically in, independent. Um, yeah, let's move to, to, to the first slide with, with conclusions. Um, so would custodianship, would, would a rights-based approach be uh, of added value? I think, I think it can be of, of added value. Uh, it can even be seen as a, net, a next step in the um, current line of development in, in EU water law, where we see that uh, quality standards, water quality standards have been uh, introduced in the uh, 70s, 80s. Uh, legal integration took place uh, in the early uh, 2000s, uh, which led to the Water Framework Directive. I think the Water Framework Directive also uh, is a proper piece of legislation in which uh, 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 river rights can be implemented. Um, and that further substantive and tailored implementation can take place in those uh, river conventions and in the framework of the river commission, commissions men, uh, mentioned. Uh, so actually, it is possible to, to introduce um, uh, a rights-based approach. But on the other hand, uh, the success thereof depends on the willingness and the, the perseverance of states to, uh, in the first place, reconsider the relation between their ecological needs and their individual, um, uh, mostly socio-economic interests, uh, where I think that that the willingness will be higher if the social economic interests are are smaller for some uh, reason. If you look, for instance, at the Scheldt uh, across the border in Belgium, uh, there's a large harbor, the harbor of Antwerp. Uh, that that's a pretty big interest, and uh, uh, I think in negotiations, the Belgians are not going to give up their harbor uh, to uh, increase the ecological potential for the river Scheldt. You can tell them the river has rights, but uh, I, I don't know if that, that, that will be feasible. Um, 
Moreover, those uh, states should also be willing to transfer power and give mandate, mandate to a, a competent authority, which is going to operate independently, so uh, politically independent uh, at the level of the international uh, uh, integrated river basin districts. Um, I don't know whether that, that, that's feasible at, at this moment, but it might be feasible in the future, uh, which actually brings me to the to the overall conclusion of uh, the presentation and also of the publication we've written, uh, which is that for the integrated river basin districts, um, that could, from an ecological uh, perspective, profit most from uh, unconventional approaches such as, such as uh, right-based approaches and the introduction of uh, custodianship, it actually seems least likely that such an approach would be adopted in due time and will be effective uh, in due time. Um, yeah, that can be seen as a, probably probably be seen as a bit of a disappointing uh, conclusion, but uh, for now, I think that's the most realistic conclusion. Um, and that's it for today. So I give the screen back to Scott. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that uh, presentation. You know what I think was good about it is, and sometimes we hear this perspective coming out of academia, you know, that not every study needs to be positive and say, oh, this th this is the exact way to go forward. Sometimes it's okay to do a study and say, we've reached, we've reached the end of the road. We've, uh, we've tapped out everything that we can, or, you know, this is a policy approach that's useful, but actually has a lot of limitations and maybe there's another way to go. I think that's really important to be able to explore uh, kind of all the avenues. So even if it's not uh, the most uh, positive uh, answer, I think it's really important to have that. So thank you for that presentation. Uh, our next presentation will come from Katie O'Brien. Hello. Okay, let me turn my screen. And just a reminder uh, to everyone, we are nearing the question and answer session uh, for our uh, event. So if you have a question, please just type it in uh, to your GoToWebinar control panel. It's on the right side, probably the right side of your screen, about halfway down, you'll see questions. Type your question in, I'll see it, and then I'll route it out to everybody else at the end. Thank you for your time and your questions. Okay, you well, thanks. Yeah, thanks, first of all, for um, inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I'm going to be talking about the this independence aspect of giving voices to rivers. And in particular, I'm going to compare the Yarra River in Victoria, which is a state in Australia, with the uh, Wanganui River in Aotearoa, New Zealand, both of which have actually been given a statutory independent voice. And I'm going to talk about what this means for the Indigenous people through whose country those rivers flow. And I'm going to start with Victoria and the Yarra River Protection Willapkin Birarong Moron Act. And this is a really important piece of legislation because it's actually the very first time that Indigenous Victorians have been recognised in legislation as having a role in water management. Just very quickly to explain the title, Willapkin Birarong Moron means keep the Yarra alive in Woi Wurrung language, and that's the language of the Wurundjeri people. Um, they're the uh, indigenous traditional owners of much of the land through which the Yarra flows. Now, the Yarra River is in fact one of Victoria's most iconic rivers. It flows from the east of the state through the centre of Melbourne, which is the capital of Victoria, and out into Port Phillip Bay. Um, but what you can probably tell from the Act's title is that the Yarra River, it's very much in need of protection. And this has been partly due in recent times to the lack of coordination and planning between the various public entities that operate along the river corridor, but also for the many years that it was used as a bit of a sewer and a drain by industry. Now, these days it is still pretty polluted, although the further back you go into the hills, the cleaner it becomes, which is pretty important given that the upper Yarra Reservoir is actually a source of about 70% of Melbourne's drinking water. Now, I'm focusing on the Indigenous rights aspect because that's certainly the main context I've been looking at it, but it's actually also something that has been heavily promoted by the Victorian government. And the other thing that's been promoted by the government, which ties in with this, is the entity it sets up called the Birarong Council. 
And I'll talk about um, that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But I wanted to highlight something that the Victorian government said about it in its media release was that the Bureau Council is to be the independent voice of the river. And of course that grabbed my attention because as most people are aware, in 2017, the New Zealand government passed legislation to appoint a guardian for the Wanganui River as part of the Wanganui River Treaty Settlement. And the media release that the New Zealand government put out when the settlement was signed off also used this phrase, independent voice, to describe the Wanganui River Guardian. And of course, that's the same term used by the Victorian government to describe the Bureau on Council. But in fact, they are quite different entities. Uh, now, as um, most people probably know, this idea of giving an independent voice to nature has actually been around, uh, certainly in theory, since the 1970s, uh, when Christopher Stone wrote his very famous article, Should Trees Have Standing? Um, now, the Birurong Council, this independent voice of the Yarra, doesn't go as far as Stone's idea because it's not a legal guardian with the ability to represent the Yarra River in court but it does advocate for and advise on the protection and preservation of the Yarra River. So just to talk a little bit uh, briefly about this act, which sets up the Birurong Council. Um, that's the Wanganui River there. Um, these are the key features that are of relevance. There are a lot of key features, but these are the ones that are of relevance uh, to Victoria's uh, Aboriginal people. First of all, and you would pick this up, um, the legislation has its Aboriginal language title will look in Birurong Moron, and it also has a preamble written in uh, Aboriginal language. Secondly, it recognises the Yarra as one living and integrated natural entity, and that's uh, consistent with Aboriginal conceptions of the Yarra. To reflect this, the Act provides for a strategic plan for the whole of the Yarra River and associated land. And the development of this strategic plan and the administration of the Act generally, it's guided by a number of protection principles. Uh, and these protection principles include some important, really important references to uh, Aboriginal cultural heritage, knowledge and values. Uh, but the feature I want to focus on here is the Birurong Council, the independent voice of the river. Now, significant, there is a statutory requirement for there to be at least two Indigenous members on the Council, it's out of a total of 12. This, as I think I mentioned earlier, is the very first time that Victoria has passed legislation which requires Indigenous representation on any entity involved in water management, a big first for Victoria. But I do want to make a couple of points about the role of the Birurong Council. First of all, it is only advisory and that advice is limited to advising the minister. There's no change to the decision makers uh, along the Yarra. Now, the minister appoints a lead agency for the purposes of the Act, and the lead agency is required to do a number of things, including the preparation of the strategic plan, uh, and the Birurong Council does have a sort of a consultative role in developing the strategic plan. Now, um, I mentioned the Bureau on Council will be the independent voice of the river. And of what I mean is that it will be independent from government. The legislation specifically says that no representatives from certain particular uh, government related entities, uh, which I think they're called uh, responsible public entities, uh, are allowed to be on the council. Uh, members are appointed for uh, four year terms. They can only be removed prior to the end of their term if they're unfit to hold office, for example, for misconduct or neglect of duty uh, that further enhances its uh, independence. Uh, I should say the council has now been in operation for over a year and in fact it does actually have three Indigenous members so it's able to have more than two, it has to have a minimum two but it, as I say in fact it has three. So they're the main features of the um, Yarra River Protection Act. So I'm going to turn now to uh, an act that's already been referred to um, today already, um, the New Zealand legislation, the Te Awa Tupua, uh, Wanganui River Claims Settlement Act. And I'm going to focus on Te Pō Tupua, the guardian of the Wanganui River. Um, first of all, um, the Wanganui River, Te Awa Tupua, uh, has been given statutory recognition as a legal person uh, and has been and as has been said already um, this means that the river itself has standing 
it can sue and be sued and it has all the rights and responsibilities of a legal person. But of course, because it's a natural object and needs someone to speak on its behalf, it's represented by a river guardian, Te Pōtupua. And Te Pōtupua has two members. Uh, I think this was also mentioned before. One is nominated uh, by the government and the other is nominated by the Wanganui Ewe. And the role of um, Te Pōtupua is to protect the river and its values. And the other uh, thing is that decision makers must consider those river values in any decisions that they make that might affect the river. So um, what are some of the benefits um, in this piece of legislation of being given legal personhood and having this independent voice in the form of a guardian? Well, first of all, and I think this was touched on earlier as well, the river values to be protected, they are Maori river values, Tupua Tekawa. Secondly, uh, the river through its guardian, it's effectively guaranteed standing to bring actions against anyone who damages those river values. Um, it is also independent from government. Um, as was mentioned, the government nominates one of the members of the river guardian, but once that person has been appointed, they don't act in the interests of the government, they act in the interests of the river. Appointments are for three years uh, and appointees can only be removed by agreement or if they decide to resign. Appointments have been made and both appointees are in fact Maori, including the one that was nominated by the government. Now, another benefit is that the river, it's deemed to be a public authority for the purposes of the Resource Management Act. Uh, that's New Zealand's primary act governing water management. This means that the river, and by extension, Tipo Tupua as its guardian, has the potential to have decision-making powers transferred to it by regional authorities. Regional authorities make most of the water management decisions under the RMA. Um, it also has the potential to enter into joint management agreements and to apply to become a heritage protection authority. Uh, it also, the other thing it does is it makes decisions on applications to a fund that's been set up to support the health and well-being of Te Awa Tupua. But there are some disadvantages um, as well in relation to the role of Māori in protecting the river. I mentioned that Te Pōtupua is independent from government. Well, this independence, it does cut both ways in that it is also independent from the Wanganui Iwi. In saying that though, the Wanganui Iwi did negotiate those values to be protected and they are all Māori oriented. But what I really think is really interesting is that there is really only an indirect role for Te Pōtupua, the guardian in the management of the river. Apart from the decisions on applications to the fund, it's actually not involved in decision making about the river. It does have the potential to be involved, but that potential does rely on agreement with regional authorities or on the approval of the minister. So it's not as of right. It's also not involved in developing the river strategy. Under the settlement legislation, there is a separate group that's set up to develop a strategy for the river. And the purpose of the strategy group is to identify issues relating to the Wanganui River, provide a strategy to address those issues and recommend actions to be taken. So it kind of sounds like something that the River Guardian should be involved in, but in fact, there is no room for the River Guardian on this strategy group. In saying that, the Wanganui Iwi themselves get to have a representative on the strategy group. So it's actually not through Te Awa Tupua, the independent voice that the Wanganui Iwi have a direct say in you know, the river management, but it's actually through the strategy group, as well as um, other entities that are set up to implement the settlement. So just to draw this all together, how does the New Zealand legislation differ from the Victorian legislation, given that they both profess to give an independent voice to the river and both emphasise Indigenous relationships with the river? Well, um, a major difference lies in the status of the river itself. Although the Yarra River Protection Act provides for the declaration of the Yarra River as one living and integrated natural entity, it doesn't give the Yarra River independent legal status with all of the rights and liabilities that come with that status. So although the Bureau on Council is able to advocate on behalf of the river, it's not its legal guardian. It's not given any legislative power to exercise the rights or take responsibility for any liabilities of the Yarra River. And the Te Awa Tupua Act, on the other hand, specifically provides for the Wanganui River to have all the rights, powers, duties and liabilities of a legal person. 
which are exercised on behalf of the river by Te Pautupua. Another distinction between the two acts is that they protect different values. The river values do to be protected in the Te Awa Tupua Act, of which there are four, called Tupua Takawa. They're intrinsically Maori oriented in their conception of the river. And in that regard, they are also written in Maori prior to an English translation. On the other hand, the river values do be protected in the Yarra River Protection Act, uh, as reflected in the Yarra Protection Principles. They're more wide ranging. They encompass not just Aboriginal cultural heritage, knowledge and values, but the values that are embodied in environmental, social, recreational management, as well as some general protection principles. Um, also, you'll see the use of Aboriginal language is confined uh, to the Act's title and preamble, unlike in the Te Awa Tupua Act. The other thing is that the Biraron Council was established to ensure that different community interests are involved in protecting and promoting the Yarra River, whereas Te Pol Tupua was established to represent the Wanganui River itself, not community interests. That role is given to the strategy group. Just a couple of other differences include the size of the respective entities. The Biraron Council has up to 12 members. Te Poutupua has only two. Te Poutupua also manages the River Rehabilitation Fund and you know, the Biraron Council doesn't have any such function. Um, I would suggest that the Biraron Council probably has more in common with the strategy group. Uh, but just finally, what does this all mean for Indigenous participation in river management? Well, certainly in Victoria, it is a big step forward in saying that Victoria was starting from a very low base of nil, nothing. Um, the independent voice, though, the Biron Council, it does only provide advice and advocacy, and Indigenous people are only 12, sorry, two out of 12 members. Um, and I would suggest that Tipo Tupua is also deficient in it that has no involvement uh, in the management of the Wanganui River unless it can reach agreement to have management powers transferred to it. It's also a step removed from the Wanganui Iwi because it acts on behalf of the river and not the Wanganui Iwi. Um, certainly not to say that neither of those entities uh, have any merit. They both clearly do have a lot going for them, but um, they do have a number of flaws, certainly that Indigenous uh, groups need to be aware of if they're you know, thinking of potentially going down that path as a way of um, protecting their interests in, um, in rivers. So on that note, I think I've certainly run out of time. I'll hand back to Scott. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that. And I really enjoyed the comparison that you were able to make between the two and to really be able to explore the role of Indigenous um, rights and responsibilities and in, in the, in the role that they're playing in the protection of these rivers. I know one of the questions that we're going to get to in the question uh, session brings that right up, so I'm sure you'll be able to really respond to it quite well. Um, we're going to get to our last uh, presenter, Tinky Lamboy, um, and as a quick reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the question box, and I'll see them, and we'll get to as many of them as we can in the limited amount of time that we have. So, Tinky, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me get my PowerPoint. There you go, looks great. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Here, Tim Klamboy from Oslo, uh, normally from Utrecht or Amsterdam or Breukelen. Here you see my university in Breukelen, Amsterdam, Nairobi Business University. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, interesting webinar. And my presentation focuses on a new governance idea concerning the Dutch Waddenzee, a beautiful creation of nature. And my co-authors of the papers for this special issue of Water International are civil law notary Dr. Christian Stockermans and Mr. Jan van der Venus. Uh, he's the informal Dutch Ombudsman for Future Generations. The the core question of today is whether we should be valuing nature for its utility to human beings as resources, property, or natural capital, or seeing it as a source of life. In the diagram on the left, you see the usual model for sustainability. 
the problem with this model is that it assumes that each circle can exist independently of the others. In reality, the only one that can exist without the others is nature. The diagram on the right is therefore more accurate. It shows a natural hierarchy of systems because without nature, there's no people and without people, there's no economy. So this leads us to the question, who owns nature and who can act on its behalf? <clears throat> um, already mentioned in uh, 1972, Professor Christopher Stone published an academic article, Shoot Trees Have Standing, towards legal rights for natural objects. It suggested that pieces of nature could be granted legal standing and that increasing public concern over the protection of nature should lead to the recognition of rights of nature. This idea got some traction, but it gets a lot more attention today. And there's a movement that promotes granting legal rights to nature. I refer to the Alliance, which started in Ecuador in 2010, the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. Its aim is to recognize and honor that nature has rights. And rather than treating nature as a property under the law, rights of nature acknowledges that nature in all its forms has its rights, to have its right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital circles. So then we, the people, have the legal authority and responsibility to enforce these rights on behalf of ecosystems. Um, for indigenous cultures around the world, um, recognizing rights of nature is simply what is so and so consistent with their traditions of living in harmony with nature this was just mentioned before um, when we look at the legal precedents that katie and anna and also katie elaborated on um, the most elaborated one is the legislation in New Zealand. I won't go into that because that has been done before. Um, also, a lot of attention got the High Court uh, judgment of the North Indian state of Uttarakhand about the rivers uh, Ganga and Yamuna. And also important, um, a lot of attention, maybe not enough attention, got the Supreme Court decision of Colombia where 25 plaintiffs invoked their right to a healthy environment and, and the government's failure to stop uh, jeopardizing the Amazon is also harming their futures and violates their constitutional rights. The court confirmed the importance of uh, protecting the rights of future generations and recognized the Colombia Amazon area as a legal entity with own rights. Um, I also refer to Ecuador and Bolivia, and I will continue with uh, the EU. Um, also in the EU, a conference was held in 2017 in the European Parliament on the rights of nature. So the EU now begins to look into the possibilities of adoption. The keynote speech was delivered by Hans Breining, the executive director of the European Environmental Agency. He stated that we believe that the rights of nature framework will be a powerful, oh, sorry. Um, sorry, something went wrong. I don't see my sheet anymore. Yeah. No, everything looks fine. <laughs> okay. Will be a powerful ally um, in achieving this goal by providing a legal imperative for systemic transformation so that humanity flourishes in harmony with nature for gen for the generations to come. I included some uh, links so that interested people can look there for more information. Well, with all these initiatives in mind, we started in the Netherlands uh, on a new research project concerning the question, should the governance of the Wadensee take place in the form of a nature legal person? The Wadensee in the Netherlands lies in the northern part, between the coast of the Dutch mainland in the south and a range of low-lying Wadden Islands and the North Sea in the north, as you can see in this picture. And the Wadensee uh, continues at the north side to Germany and Denmark. The word wat in Dutch is, uh, yeah, the word wat in Dutch means mud flat. This landscape is a unique ecosystem it is the largest tidal wetland in the world. 
Many of the Baden Islands offer popular seaside recreation facilities and activities. As the Wadensee comprises wetlands, the area is rich of biological diversity. It is the home of various species of seals, and the area is also very important for migratory birds. Up to 6.1 million birds can be present at the same time in the Wadensee, including the German and the Danish parts. And an average of 10 to 12 million pass through it every year. The area provides a habitat up to 10,000 species estimated in the form of one cell organism, plants, fungi, and animals. However, um, like any precious nature area in the world, also the Wadensee ecosystem encounters dangers. There's intensive human activity, shipping, including some ports, recreation, agriculture, military activity, mining for gas and salt, and fishing. And the dangers um, are mainly for the birds. When you look at the bird migration report, East Atlantic Flyway, for seals, when uh, we look at the level of chemicals, noise, and bo boating in the bottom day, and overfishing. And um, last but not least, um, when the level, the sea level is rising due to climate change, the whole modern day ecosystem, the tidal um, area can disappear. I pointed out that in the health of the modern day, uh, of this valuable ecosystem is a danger. And despite the fact that there are many legal frameworks applying to the modern day, at an international, EU, and national level, such as um, the entire Wadensee was indicated as a biosphere reserve by UNESCO in 1986. And it was also included in the um, World Heritage List of UNESCO in 2009 and 2014. And then there are many other international treaties. I <coughs> refer to the Convention for the Protection of Marine Environment in the Northeast Atlantic, the OSCAR. OSPAR Treaty, uh, the Trilateral Modern Day Cooperation Treaty, the Agreement for the Conservation of Seals, the Ramsar uh, Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, and then at the EU level, uh, it was already explained how the EU Water Framework Directive works, and then the Modern Day is also subject to the Habitats Directive, the Birds Directive, and the Natura 2000 Ecological Network. Um, in, the in the Netherlands, um, there are two ministries involved in governing uh, the Wadensee. It's the Ministry for Infrastructure and Water and the Ministry for Agriculture and Fisheries. And the legal framework um, um, yeah, uh, is based on the Wadensee zoning framework. And the latest one is the third Wadensee Memorandum of 2007. And um, yeah, I also want to point out that the Wadensee, the Dutch part, is not a national park um, as a whole and the local law, only some parts have that status. Um, so we concluded that the current governance of the Wadensee is not um, sufficient to protect the valuable ecosystem uh, of the modern day, as I indicated before. So we were looking whether uh, under our Dutch civil code in book two on legal persons, there would be any possibilities to create a legal personhood for the modern day. Um, we found article one in this book, which states that the state, the provinces, the municipality, the water boards, are bodies to which legislative power has been granted under the Dutch constitution. And um, especially water boards, um, we would call that watersheds in Dutch authorship, would be very appropriate to use for making the Dutch Wadensee a legal person. Because a waterschap, a watershed, is connected to a certain area. And it really represents the oldest form of democracy in the Netherlands. Waterships um, are represented by people elected by uh, people in the area of the watership. 
and it has a function to protect the area and to regulate the water level in the area. So if we would um, use that legal form in nature ship, um, I could see several advantages because then we would create a rights-based position for the modern day in discussions about its use and destiny. Uh, very important in that context is the st statutory purpose clause of such a legal person because that is leading the people who are representing it. They have to follow the elements that are covered by that purpose clause. Um, in the purpose clause, we could give um, um, more prominence to nature and to balancing the interests of uh, the whole area. Um, yeah, and a very important question in that uh, line is who should be representing such a nature ship? So how would the governance be set up? Uh, which governance bodies would you need? And would you elect the people in such a body or appoint them? And which stakeholders should be included? So this actually is um, part of our next um, research project in which we want to um, um, assess through stakeholders meetings and expert meetings in, what, in which way we could best propose a governance structure for the volunteer. So the project is to be continued and thanks very much for your attention. Well, thank you for that really great presentation. And I enjoyed much as Anne uh, brought through private property rights, you kind of brought through on the rights to nature. And while private property rights are a little bit more of an established legal regime and the rights to nature are maybe still more um, emerging as you brought forward, um, I think it's really interesting. And I think we'll probably should bring this up in the conversation on our LinkedIn uh, page as well. But that, you know, the, the rights of the river can kind of be drawn from other different areas and strengthened through the engagement with other bodies of uh, law. So excellent presentation. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. First of all, I want to note that we are running just a little bit late time for audience questions. And I've seen that a lot of you already written in with some great questions. If my panelists need to leave or, uh, at the uh, 1.30 hour time, uh, whatever time it is for you, um, I totally understand. But if not, I'll probably try to pull the webinar across a little bit longer just so we can get to a few more of the questions. We're going to quickly go to the poll. Um, and this should be, here we go, uh, to see who will drive a broader adaptation for the rights to the river. So um, this isn't a necessarily a scientific poll, but uh, if you can go ahead and for my audience question, uh, my audience is to, uh, do you think it'll be politicians, local activists, uh, broader global public support, or lawyers? Oh, here right now, the first answer was 100% lawyers. I think there's some bias, but uh, let's just see how this goes. Um, we'll go ahead and keep the poll open for a minute or two. Um, and it's also give you an opportunity to uh, ask any last minute questions. Like I said, if you have a question that's, um, particular for any one of our presentations, um, go ahead and feel free to follow up with them. And if I see your question was too uh, focused, uh, I may just uh, not ask it and uh, ask you just to kind of uh, follow up with any presentator. Um, but um, we will have an opportunity to, to, to get that those answers for you. Um, also, I know it always comes up several times. Uh, we will definitely have the presentations online as soon as possible. Um, as soon as uh, my, my panelists send them to you, us, uh, we get them up on, on the internet and uh, we'll also have a recording up on the internet. So if you go to our website, www.iwra.org, you'll see up at the top, it says, um, I believe there's a section for our projects, uh, webinars. Uh, that's my special little section, webinars. So go ahead and click on that. You'll see all of our webinars. They're all recorded. They're all up there. So you can go back and look at our old issues and our old uh, events and uh, look, uh, then watch them. And uh, you'll see the presentations from this event as well. So that'll be pretty easy and uh, straightforward. Uh, we'll get there as soon as we can. All right. We have 62% uh, of the people have voted. Um, and looks like we have an overwhelming kind of response. Uh, I'll give it here just a few more seconds and go ahead and close it up. Um, and it looks like our, our, our early front leader of lawyers has, has dropped off. So hard to believe. Um, yeah, over 70% of people voted. That's great. I love democracy. Okay. 
We're going to close the event and uh, with 50% uh, of people voted, voted for uh, global public support with 27 at local activists. So I think that that kind of points out to me at least that it's kind of drawing from uh, not to say the grassroots, but from the people, from the populace, rather than people of any one particular profession or background. Um, I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. I mean, I don't always do these polls in the most scientific fashion, but uh, I think that this kind of uh, draws from that uh, conclusions. So not very scientific, but very interesting. Let's go to our first questions. Um, so First question from uh, Samid Daish, uh, a researcher with the Water Resources Area at Innovation and Research Management Center at the National Energy University of Malaysia. It's a big business card. Uh, asks that what are the methods and ways to access water to meet Aboriginal economic development needs? So um, I know that uh, some of our presenters today are really were able to engage on the uh, uh, Aboriginal or Indigenous uh, rights issues. So maybe they can kind of respond. Um, and a uh, reminder to my panelists, go ahead and uh, don't wait for me to call on you, just uh, jump in when you can, uh, turn your microphone on and, and answer. So methods and ways to access water to meet Aboriginal economic development needs. Um, look, I can probably say a little bit about that just in terms of um, Australia and Victoria. Um, currently, um, the only way for Aboriginal people to access water for economic needs is to actually, um, Australia has a, certainly um, Victoria and um, in the eastern part of Australia has a very um, highly developed market, water market system. So um, there are licences that you have to apply for and there are all sorts of fees to be paid. Um, this, in fact, I should say, uh, has been recognised as an issue in, in Victoria. The government has recognised this as an issue in Victoria. So it's you know, currently looking um, into ways um, to enable um, Aboriginal people to access water for economic needs. So that's, <laughs> that's a little snapshot from Victoria. <laughs> Uh, maybe I can add something, but it's not about er Aboriginals, but about about Maori um, in New Zealand. Uh, there, I know that there are uh, laws on um, the customary fishing rights, for example, of Maori. Uh, that um, so that those commercial rights, you could say, of Maori are protected by law uh, when it comes to fishing in the sea. Uh, and everyone should have access. I think all ci citizens to the sea as well, which is also part of that. Um, custom uh, and respect for Maori. So this is not Aboriginals, but it is a, a way of, of dealing with it. Okay, well, we can go on to our next question. Uh, Zure Yidago, uh, who has uh, published with us and I think has done a special issue with us, um, has a number of questions, but I know that uh, his particular background comes from transboundary issues. So I'm going to focus in on his question about uh, are there any innovative interpretations of the UN Watercourse Convention articles to support the new proposition of a river as a legal person? Has anyone focused on a uh, UN Watercourse Convention? Any ideas? If not, he's also interested to learn about um, the approaches between river rights or river basin rights. Should uh, Is there a distinction to be made there between the rights of the physical river and the whole basin? And uh, what are some of the differences of scope there? Uh, maybe I can add a bit about that. I think that there is really a distinct uh, difference between river basin rights and river rights as far as I would view it, it's the river rights concern the water itself and the basin also concern all the land surrounding it, which waters towards the river. And that is a much more complex issue to address because then you have also the land use in the whole catchment that you have to incorporate and everything that is uh, entailed to that. On the other way, if you want to really want to influence water quality and water rights, that is maybe the way to go forward, but uh, it really sets a long, strong demand on other societal functions. Maybe okay. that's the next step after establishing river rights. I guess so, river yes. Basin rights, yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Does anyone else want to, to weigh in there? 
Um, the only thing I would say is that in terms of the Yarra River Protection Act, um, it actually applies to um, the Yarra River um, and its catchment area. So it's not limited to just that little narrow part of the river itself. It's, it's wider than that and includes some of the land around it. And it's, I think it's the same with the Whanganui River as well. It's mm. you know, one living hole um, uh, from mountain to sea, uh, uh, also uh, relating to other like plants uh, attached to the river basin and things like that. So. Excellent. Well, um, I think we're going to our next question. This comes um, from Anthony Slater. Um, and Anthony had a couple of questions. I'm gonna, Anthony, if you have a question uh, for one of our particular speakers, uh, please go ahead and follow up with them and I'll ask your general question here now. Um, he asks, what is the difference in outcome from giving a river legal personality and giving the river the same kind of water rights that people have being the model of the environmental water holders? What approach do you think gives the river more real protection? Kind of analysis. Um, may, maybe I uh, answer that a, a little bit mm -hmm. because uh, it, it also relates to uh, can you maybe uh, give uh, property uh, without giving the property rights without giving the river a legal personhood? Um, I think from that perspective, when it is about ownership, you need to give uh, nature legal personhood first before you can give other rights. Um, so I would say that um, uh, you cannot really do that without having a legal person to assign rights to. Um, and this is just how, at least in private law, we work. Um, now, maybe in environmental law, it's different because there you, you see protection. Um, of, of rivers uh, that have no uh, legal personhood, but in, in private law, you can only assign private law rights um, to a legal person. So there you, you need legal personhood. Okay. Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can also add for the voluntary that if you make the voluntary, if you include it in a legal person, it's an actor at the table. I mean, it really has rights to talk about its destiny and how the voluntary can be used. At this moment, it doesn't have any voice. It's just the object that other people talk about and uh, decide about. So I think granting legal personhood is, like Anna says, the first step to do if you really want to cherish an ecosystem of a river in, or in my study object, the Wadense. I can also okay. confirm what the what the others have been saying, and, and also in relation to custodianship, for example, um, to really elevate um, the mandate of the custodian, you need to create the legal personhood first, and then uh, uh, <clears throat> transfer some some tangible competences to uh, the, the custodian at the level of of the hydrological governance unit. I think one of our next questions kind of touches on some of this, though, maybe follows on. It's nice to touch. Um, it says, how is it from uh, Amrish Pandey, uh, how is it possible to grant rights to nature in a limited and quantified manner? So by leaving them from the burdens of duties and creating at the same time the correlative duties for humans in many ways. So, I mean, uh, can you maybe dig into this a little bit more about, you know, so first you're, you're granting the rights. Um, in a limited way, and then how exactly should that proceed, maybe? And since for the voluntary, it depends on the legal purpose clause that you incorporate in the statutory act. So what is exactly the legal purpose, the aim of this legal person? In that legal purpose clause, you can include whatever you want, either um, a priority on maintaining the nature quality, the health of the ecosystem, or is it intended for co-use with the people living around the Latin Bay, or maybe one of maybe some other types of co-use. And that legal purpose clause is leading for the board that will be appointed or elected and that will take the decisions about anything that will happen in regard to that area. So they have to follow the legal purpose clause. So that's, yeah, that's the leading 
the leading line. Excellent. Well, uh, our next question, and I think I can kind of combine a couple here, but um, Aaron Akadu from Uganda asks, who are the support, uh, who is supposed to recognize various legal persons to represent the voices of local communities and the marginalized? And how effective is this in countries with weak judicial systems? Won't it be a, just a theoretical cover for mismanagement of river basins? And uh, Zure Yugato also is asking about how this might be rectified, uh, how this could be played out in um, transboundary situations um, where two two countries uh, have completely different, um, sharing the same river basin, sharing the, the, the same uh, waters, but completely different legal systems. How would you be able to, to, to put these together, if at all? Um, yeah, so so uh, I'll just give it a shot, uh, maybe. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, this is very difficult, uh, but it's very difficult anyway, also in environmental law, if you have uh, to cooperate with other countries. Um, but if you would make a river a legal person and it's recognized by various uh, country states, uh, and it would have its own ownership, for example, um, and that would be enforceable in both countries, so you really need to cooperate then between countries. Um, then that could actually help uh, maybe countries to cooperate better. So it, it's been said in a way that, that uh, in uh, New Zealand, the Whanganui River, um, uh, having its own uh, base in, in, in property is uh, um, a compromise uh, between Maori and the state uh, over fight over ownership. Um, and that it provides a platform where they neutrally work together. Similarly, you could say that states may be more willing to uh, uh, neutrally work together without fighting over ownership if that ownership is not placed with those states. So maybe you can say that it, it's challenging as it always is if you have to work together with other countries. Um, but maybe this will help them in a way to focus less on who owns what and to focus more on what the river wants. So I actually see some opportunities there. Excellent. Does anyone else want to weigh in? May I follow up on that? Yes, please do. Okay, because uh, I just would like to follow up on what Anne said about that it would create a platform for countries to work together. And I think that, that could be very interesting. In the Netherlands, we have quite some experience with the International Rhine Committee, and that's not a legal personhood, but it is a platform. And what we see there, uh, Germany has quite different legislation than the Netherlands has, but the topics that are brought into this commission are usually agenda setting for the different countries. So uh, when one country is facing difficulties, it is something that they are exploring on how it should be addressed in their own country. So I think those kind of experience could also be used to give some shape to such a platform. I think we have time for one final question. And if anyone has to, my panelists have to leave, I completely understand. Thank you for your time. Uh, so please don't feel like you have to stay. But um, Laura Burgers asks, um, and she specifically, I was asking uh, Katie O'Brien, but um, I think this kind of maybe can be rephrased in a way that, that, that encapsulates and, and maybe summarizes our whole uh, event. But um, she asks, uh, do you think the core of the rights to nature, and here I might add the rights to the river movement is to, um, she says, to emancipate uh, indigenous people uh, or to leave anthropocentrism? And I think it's a question maybe to ask, you know, is the rights to the river movement um, about a broader, uh, complete shift in the ways that we understand um, rights and how they apply, or can it be used in a thought of as a much more limited fashion as just uh, one tool in the toolbox that can perhaps be used to protect some rivers and people? So, um, with that, we have our final question. Uh, so, anyone can, is welcome to, to jump in. <laughs> I think. Um... For now, it will be one of the tools in the big toolbox of protecting nature um, because we are set in a system as it is, but of course with hopes to change the anthropocenic 
view on nature into a more rights-based uh, situation of nature. That would be my answer. Excellent. Anyone else? Does anyone else want to weigh in or we can close off the webinar? All right. Well, again, I would like to thank our panel. Uh, thank you everyone for showing up and sticking around a little bit extra longer. A uh, big thank you to Anne de Vries Stojan, a PhD candidate at Tilbury Law School, Herman Casper Gilson, an assistant professor at Ulrich University, Tinke Lamboy, a professor at Neuroid uh, Business University, Katie O'Brien, a lecturer at Monash University, Kathy Sukins, an affiliated researcher at Utrecht University, Marlene Van Riedrich, a professor at uh, Utrecht University, and Susan Wuch, senior researcher at the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment. I know that some of our panel and iDebury itself were all on Twitter, so go ahead and look us up and follow us if you're interested to uh, stay on top of the social media. Uh, as I mentioned, these presentations um, may leave you wanting to keep the debate going, so go to our LinkedIn webpage. Um, we'll have the uh, presentations and we'll have the video, so you can watch this just as many times as you like. Uh, you continue the discussion. We'll have questions up there and you can kind of interact and, and can keep continuing the debate. So go to our LinkedIn webpage and check that out. I really hope that everyone in the audience found the insights provided by our panel really uh, helpful. Uh, it gave me a lot of material to think about in the upcoming days, and I hope that it's going to be generating a lot of creativity about your own work, whether or not that's going to be academic or whether or not it's going to be practitioner level. I uh, hope this kind of helps push forward about what you're doing. Um, to remind everyone again, the webinar is brought to you by the International Water Resources Association, or over 40 year old nonprofit, non governmental educational organization. We're almost about to have our 50th birthday celebration. It's coming, I will tell you later. Uh, we focus on bridging disciplines and geographies and connecting professionals, students, individuals, and corporations, institutions. Everyone is concerned with the sustainable use of the world's water resources. And we are a membership based organization. So if you're interested in learning more about us uh, or becoming a member, uh, please go to www.iwra.org. You'll find a wealth of resources there, uh, learning about us, uh, the work we do, and uh, how to become a member as well as recording to the webinar and slides. So uh, on behalf of the whole IWRA office, thank you for doing the webinar and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye. 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 Thank you.